Hello, David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. I am joined by friend, not so much neighbor, but subject matter expertise on the video that we're talking about today because we are talking about James Bond video games. And I've wanted to do this video for a long time. And literally, there was only one person in the world that I respected enough, that I emulated enough, that really could hold his own in this conversation. But he wasn't available. <laughs> so I've asked Calvin. That was awful. That was, like that was brilliant. That, that was, was the best. Awful. I was. I, I didn't see it coming either. It really got me that twist. <laughs> I was like, always oh, being so nice. Ladies and gentlemen, oh Calvin Dyson. Calvin, welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me back and to talk about something that I'm very, very excited to talk about, uh, Bond video games. I don't think there's enough discussion out there about Bond video games. So, um, yeah, there's very really pleased any, to talk and, about. and you know, I mean, I'm like you. I try to create some unique content, and I thought, oh, people have talked about it to death. But honestly, you have been really the one waving the flag of these James Bond video games. And beyond that, I didn't see a lot of discussion. So what I liked about also you and I doing this um, beyond our audience is that truly we are kind of chronological bookends. Uh, you are <laughs> amongst the younger uh, individuals that have really gravitated to Bond out there. And I'm, I don't want to say I'm the oldest, but you know, I'm definitely 52 not. years old. <laughs> definitely well, not. And by the way, um, it meant so much to me to have you on today that I'm fully representing. <gasps> yes. Ah, oh, brilliant. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. That was for I'm you. Sure gonna Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I'm sure we're going to have some very unkind things to say about um, the Moonraker segments. We shall see. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I love Moonraker. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorites, but that's that's for another show. All right. <laughs> So let's get down to it. Talk to me a little bit about your entry into the world of James Bond video games. What was that first situation experience? Oh God, it was definitely it was definitely GoldenEye on the N64, as I think many people sort of like like me who was sort of in adolescence during the 90s. Um, and then GoldenEye naturally sort of like led into Agent Under Fire and Nightfire and that kind of end of the 90s early noughties was sort of my golden time for uh bond uh fandom really and a large part of that was those games and golden i i i was trying to think about this uh recently actually because like, obviously knowing we we're going to be talking about this i can't remember whether i first knew about james bond as a concept from that game or from the films like i very much remember which my first bond film was but i have i pretty sure when i opened that you know that video cassette and it was like roger moore's face on it and james bond i was sort of like yeah no i think i know what this is and i think it's from that game that we play like me and my friends when we were like eight nine years old or whatever um so yeah golden eye n64 was my entry into this into this world as it was for many people I've, I've run into, and I've said this time and time again, I've run into so, so many people your age and maybe even a little bit older who their first foray, their first emotional connection to Bond was the video game, was Goldeneye. And I, I can't blame them. I mean, it's still, I think, regarded mm -hmm. amongst the best. And we'll talk about the individual ones. But is it something that you would just pick up and play and lose yourself? I mean, Bond is escapism. So was mm -hmm. it something that was almost therapeutic to you? I mean, what was that emotional connection? With GoldenEye, specifically in the N64 one, I think it was so much about the multiplayer experience and getting together with your friends. And it was such a perfectly fine-tuned multiplayer. Like when you get four people in a room and you play that game, it was something kind of special and magic. And I, we played the multiplayer a hell of a lot more than we played the single player, that's for sure. And if we did play the single player, we'd put on all the cheats and, you know, infinite ammo, infinite health, that sort of thing. So... For that, it was much less about the story. For us as like eight, nine-year-olds anyway, and it was like, when you look back on it, you can see it was such a revolutionary game in itself. And I think right. it's, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but it sort of transcends the, you know, the James Bond label, really, and becomes something else. That game has a life of its own outside of Bond. Um, That's true. Yeah. What about you? What? Do you play much GoldenEye? 
I, I did. I did. It wasn't it wasn't my first, though. Um, oh, interesting. And again, because of my age and everything like that, I mean, everything was about uh, the Atari 2600 when I was really young, obviously, that gaming system. And if you can remember, there was a time with Atari, because I know you've done your history. Um, there was a time with Atari where they just started grabbing every every brand and franchise they could, you know, the, yeah. the ET is a legendary story. For example, they've done yep. all types of things. I mean, they weren't all about the, the really good ones. And, um, I have an artifact. I'm not the only artifact on this, but <laughs> here it is. No way. This is oh, it right here. My goodness. So this that is, is something special. 1983. And it even still has the, um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, Guildrose Publications Limited, 1983, Eon Productions, James Bond 007. And wow. I actually do remember playing this game in 1983. Um, I wasn't a major Bond fan, but I, I had to think about, oh my gosh, it really was, I think, the very, very first James Bond video game that was ever created, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's as far as I'm aware, yeah. Uh, but I, I, but I've never actually played it. Like, I don't really, do you remember much about it? Do you remember? I like... do. I do. I had to kind of look it up a little bit there. The graphics are pretty adequate for an Atari 2600 game, but it basically is, um, a series. It's a scrolling game, first of all. So it's yeah. basically either kind of the Lotus submarine, which doesn't look horrific and, or helicopter. So you kind of choose between the two. Um, and it, the, the whole entire thing which is fascinating to think back on this. The whole entire thing revolved around an oil rig, and it was Sprang's <laughs> oil rig. Um, if you remember from Diamonds Are Forever, the book, there was a character named Sprang. Yeah. So they, instead of taking anything from the movies, they they took excerpts from the book and they created this this video game around it. That's fascinating. That's yeah. really interesting. I'm sure we'll talk a bit more, yeah, later on about sort of like where they get their inspiration and um, everything. But that has like thrown me immediately. <laughs> I did not know that. It's it's bizarre. And if um, somebody said that someone translated it into something that you can play online. So if I can find the link, I'll put the link below because people I think will be fascinated to see what this thing looks like. Yeah. And like you say that you could see like, you know, the Lotus was, you know, uh, it was legible as a Lotus. Did it yeah, feel I mean, like... It was... It was a, if you squint, right? Cause that was 2600, <laughs> but it was a series of blocks, but then they would uh, have like a little block, a uh, white block that you could tell that there was a fin. So yeah. you could really kind of make out what it was. Okay. Yeah. Did it feel like you were playing a Bond game though? Did it? No, yeah. no, it, 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 um, it's, it's basically, <laughs> it was bizarre. It was a car. When you played the car, you could jump and do th different things with the car. Um, yeah but it almost felt like they were repurposing a different engine or a different model and, and slapped mm. the uh, 007 sticker on it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It I didn't think immerse it... me into the world of 007. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's, it's probably just limitations of the technology. Like I think it would take them a while to sort of be able to like, you know, something like Mario, which was born out of being a video game, like the mechanics of the gameplay are sort of embedded into the brand and the, the character and everything. Whereas you take something like Bond, which is, you know, Prime, you know, I, I think, you know, primarily a book, a character, obviously, but then yeah. probably better known as a film character as well. And trying to emulate that world in a video game, you need a certain level of um, technology to do that. And it certainly took yeah. them a while to do that, I think. And by the way, this is not a braggadocious thing, but I think, um, for example, gosh, 1983, I would have been 15 years old. Back then, we had to have more of a vivid imagination because things mm. weren't painted beautifully for us. We didn't have the games, yep. for example, I sound like an old man in the mountain, get, get off my lawn, <laughs> you kids. But the reality was, is we had to paint the pictures in our heads. So yeah. I, I remember not being immersive because it didn't feel like a Bond action, but I never looked at the graphics and said, well, this isn't realistic. Yeah. That's not even how we thought about games back then. Right, yeah, that's interesting because now I feel like it's, them. Yeah. Now I feel like it's the opposite of that. It's like yeah. you expect like a you know, level of realism, like Red Dead Redemption or something that whenever there was Rockstar games that are just so lifelike and you can Absolutely. lose yourself in them. <laughs> and we're going to get to that because we're going to get to like kind of our fantasy games uh, at towards mm. the end. But as a as a game bit of historian. And I, I really do consider you that because you do know a lot about the games. Have you gone back 
and played some of the older games. I mean, obviously, GoldenEye was your first, but have you gone backwards? The furthest back I've gone is The Duel, uh, which was for the Sega, I think it was the Mega Drive. Um, but I played, yeah, I played that years ago, and then I recently played it online again. Um, it's the one with Timothy Dalton, the license to kill image on the box art. And it's like a side-scrolling thing where you're Bond yes. and you're like a, a villain's base and you go around shooting. Uh, but it, it, it had that problem of like, this doesn't feel like this is a Bond game. This feels like this is a platform, kind of like what you were saying, where it's like it's a bunch of pixels and they've slapped like something that vaguely looks like a tuxedo on it yeah. and selling it as a Bond game. Um, there's well, some just, bits where you have to like you know, save girls and stuff, and uh, well, that's a little bondish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind of, you know, blow things up. Try. Yeah. Well, just, just to be complete, because we we really do want this video to be complete. Um, mm -hmm. one of the things that we should do is step back and and we'll have some graphics and some visuals here splayed out for people. But uh, 1985 um, saw two A View to a Kill games. Were you aware of that? I was. Only, I've never played either of them, but I'm aware that one of them was like a text-based game, right? Yes, and I think the one interesting thing out of that, I mean, text-based, I remember those games where it's like, you know, you're James Bond. Would you like to open the door? Why? You know, <laughs> would, would you like to say hello to M? Why? Um, wow. So I remember those, but um, I believe this particular one was written by Raymond Benson, which makes it very interesting, who wrote oh, interesting. a lot of the... The books later so he did he did a view to a kill and then he did another text best uh, based game around goldfinger uh, a couple years later which makes huh. sense that they would have an author of a book do that yeah that's so interesting uh, did you play them i did not i did not yeah. i i literally found this in the research for this video like the the view to a kill one that i saw came out in uh, 1985 for the commodore 64 it looked like literally it was an action game uh, split into three missions. It sounds kind of cool. Like I would love to find this online. So basically the first mission is you race around Paris in a taxi and try to catch <laughs> a parachuting Mayday. So Mayday's like oh, parachuting down and you're in a taxi trying to have her fall on you. Nice. Doesn't sound bad. Second mission <laughs> is you've got to res rescue Stacy Sutton, James, <laughs> from a burning city hall. And it's a point and click adventure. So you click and you make him climb up these things and avoid debris and fire. Doesn't Can you leave bad. her there? Can you leave her in the burning lift shaft? Ooh, I like that. I would do game over all day long. And then the final mission is um, you got to jump around um, a mine to defuse a bomb, which is kind of like the end of the movie and just make sure that you don't step on mines and make things explode. So it doesn't sound horrific. There's a little capture of uh, some visual here. It looks very basic though. It's 1985. Yeah, interesting. I, I wish that there was a way to, that more of these games were available online in some form because the technology, like I'm not even sure if you had like a Commodore 64, if you could even, you know, attach it to a TV now. I can't imagine all the adapters you'd need. I know, would it break things apart and just go crazy? But so you, you've gone back as far as the Living Daylights one or the License to Kill one? Uh, the License to Kill one it was, yeah. I think it's like 93, something like that. So there is a big chunk of the games that i've never played and a part of that is because i'm a bit of a purist when it comes to like, even with the duel when i was playing it online i am a bit of a purist for trying to play a game in its original form as best possible so with the controller original controller and all that kind of thing um so but not, it's just so not hard. with the arrows and things like that on a computer that would drive you crazy yeah yeah no exactly yeah yeah well, we've got, we've got, listen to this. This is crazy. So um, Living Daylights, 1987, 1987 James Bond game. Again, Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amiga. Um, this was basically simple gameplay style uh, side-scroller. Just a simple side-scroller, just aim and shoot. That mm. sounds really boring. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, the reviewer says it was. And then they had... <laughs> This one I want to get a hold of. So this is I'm gonna I'm gonna start making a wish list for us, for, and for those listening, if you can get us a link to these or or just send them to Calvin because he'll appreciate them more. But I will. Um, I will. <laughs> 1988. You weren't even a zygote then. Um, no. James Bond Live and Let Die video game. That and would be interesting. So uh... so they they took Aqua Blast, which was I remember this game. It was a very popular uh, boat game speedboat mm. game 
<laughs> this is hysterical how video games are born. And they basically <laughs> said, you know what this looks like? This looks like a live and let die excerpt when they're really doing the boating. <laughs> and that's the whole game. It's literally you in a boat going like in and out of the bayou, uh, just trying to survive. Floating you have, logs, like, alligators, Jared Pepper chasing after you, like uh, no, none it's, of that. Just yeah, it's uh, what does it say? It's a gameplay: jumping over floating logs, um, sliding up hill sli- hillsides in a boat. Uh, fuel barrels have to be collected, avoiding explosions. It says it's a fun little game, but over very quickly. Yeah, I mean that's literally the extent of it. Interesting. Huh. And then 1989, License to Kill. Now, that's what I'm trying to figure out if that's the one that you're calling The Duel. Oh, no, no, no. The one the one that I'm um, talking about was called The Duel. Uh, oh, it The was Duel. 1993. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, it was my pronunciation. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to get there. So, yeah. so yeah. in 1990, I feel like I'm taking you on a uh, historical tour of these. Um, no, no, no. I, I love it. You you called me the historian, but you've done a far better job at these earlier ones than well, me. Well, you're, you're going to lose me at a certain point, and then you're going to take over with the newer <laughs> ones. So 1990, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me. I played this, and this was something um, – it was for the Atari – It was a total ripoff of. Do you remember a game called Spy Hunter? Yes. It in, in, in had the Yes, it was a card game that it basically just shifted and a little bit up and down. Yeah. So they took the Spy Hunter engine and they basically plopped it over the Spy Who Loved Me. So it's a scrolling, racing, and shooting game. You can shoot a little bit. Um, There is a little bit of boating in here as well. But people hated this game because I guess they made it too difficult. So people would play it for a few minutes and then call it a day. Interesting. Probably not a lot of them out there. (laughs) Um, 1990, Atari created... Can you believe... First of all, let's stop for a second. Every single year, they would have multiple games come out. Let's like keep that in mind. I know I can't believe how many like because what when was the first one like 1983 something 1983, like that. Yeah. Already we've like yeah talked about so many. It's astonishing yeah. really. This is the second one I'm going to read you for 1990 alone. James Bond 007: The Stealth Affair, and this was for Amiga, Atari. Have you heard of this? Uh, I've heard of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Operation oh. Stealth. It was uh, was actually only released in the U.S. market, which is kind of interesting, and um, it had Bond working with the CIA in kind of a you know click and point adventure. So it was Bond kind of walking around in a real. The graphics look oh, horrific. I saw kind of an excerpt <laughs> from this. It's pretty bad. Ah, okay, interesting. Again, we're seeing a lot of very different types of game here i suppose because I, I suppose that that carries on throughout the entire series really uh but yeah we've had like what racing game speedboat racing games text-based ones point and click it's a yeah. lot side scrollers it's, a lot. it's a and just when you thought there wasn't enough variety for the sake of variety 1982 saw james bond jr Oh, yes, I know this one. Yeah, yeah. Oof-a. This was on the SNES, wasn't it? The Super Nintendo. That's correct. Yeah, yes. yeah. Have you played it? Yeah. I think I did years ago. Uh, I think a friend had it. I never actually owned it. Like, now I treat, like, all of my, like, Bond video game cases like they're, like, treasured <laughs> artifacts. I really wish I'd just, Fine like... China. Oh, God, no, I really do. I wish I'd just, like... Uh, collected as many as I could back then, back when they were more easily available. Uh, but yeah, this was like a side-scrolling, a bit like the duel, really, where it's, um, you know, like I said, Joe James Bond Jr. Obviously, it's based on the cartoon series that was around the time. And it's side-scrolling. You're yeah. beating up bad guys, getting to the, the end of the The company, level. there was actually an interesting THQ, the company that put this out, they said it was a huge failure. Less about the game, which they actually admitted was um, mediocre. Like you get hit once and you're dead. So Mm. people were frustrated, but Mm. uh, mostly because James Bond Jr. just never really connected with the public. No, it only lasted for like one season, I think, think the the show. Yeah. So bizarre little show. Yeah. (laughs) And I think it was probably over by 92 when the game was released. So probably. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, I'm sure it was in the clearance bin. So yeah. (laughs) 
All right, so now we've got something that you can really sink your teeth into. We've got 1993 and James Bond 007, The Duel. Yeah. And you played this. I did, yeah, yeah. Uh, and like I say, I revisited it recently as well. And it I, I don't know if it necessarily holds up well as a side-scrolling shooter or as a Bond game. It's The colors are very vibrant. It's strange. There's You are a guy in a tuxedo, and there are bad guys who sort of resemble Jaws around, but... It, it doesn't feel like a Bond game. It feels, yeah, you know, it's like you could have, you know, put the guy in a combat, you know, tracksuit or something, and it could have been something else. It doesn't, especially not with Timothy Dalton, the because Timothy Dalton's on the front cover of the right. game box, so it's hardly an emulation of the kind of stuff that he was doing in his films. It does feel like something else. Um, but yeah, very yeah. just middle of the basic. road. Yeah, it, it, very it basic. Almost, it, Feels like then, because the next one obviously is Goldeneye. And it yeah. almost feels like that was a major apology for some of the anemic ones that had come before. Oh God, yeah. I mean, that game is, like I said earlier on, it is a game that transcends the whole Bond thing and it is just this iconic thing in its own right. And I think a lot of people, like not people who are Bond fans who obviously know the films like you know the backs of the hand like we do but i think a lot of people just kind of merge the film and the game together in their minds so a lot of people who maybe have seen a bond film or two they will always call out golden eye as being one of the best and then often from that they'll or at least in my experience anyway they'll often go off on a tangent about how much they loved that game yeah. which was really revolutionary at the time as well it wasn't actually the first the first ever first person shooter because doom had done that Mm. Uh, before but it was one it was the first one that had really fine-tuned some mechanics and specifically things like I, I believe it was the first game to do this anyway where you can shoot a, a bad guy in a different part of the body and they will react differently to it they will receive different damage for it and it did kind of um popularize the whole uh <laughs> the the satisfaction of getting a good headshot <laughs> in one of those games because you if you just lined up the crosshairs right and shot and then the body reacted it was always so um so satisfying um and you know what we were saying about uh, James Bond Jr. not being a very effective tie-in, like Goldeneye was released in 97, which mm. is obviously a couple of years after the film had come out and Tomorrow Never Dies was out then. So right. it's hardly like a, it's hardly a tie-in at that point. It's hardly even a promotional um, element, really, which I find really interesting and fascinating. But what uh, was really cool, and, and I actually own some of these things, um, you may have some as well. Goldeneye was one of the first games, certainly James Bond games, to actually have um, physical products and marketing tie-ins, so watches mm. and yeah. clocks. And they really created almost like a surround sound for this game. Mm. I think they knew they had a winner on their hands. Oh, yeah, they, they must have done. Like, uh, yeah. And I know I know that, it, that, I mean, I don't think, know if it was developed for much longer than most other games, but they had a really cool, very dedicated team at Rare, who were the um, yeah. company that made the game. Um, and I know from like reading interviews with like David Doak, who was one of the lead people um, uh, designing and developing the game, that the multiplayer was such like an afterthought kind of thing. They just had one guy in the office who was like, oh, hey, I think this might be cool. And it's just so fascinating to think of like that game without the multiplayer, because the, the, the story mode does kind of follow the GoldenEye film quite well and it goes off on tangents here and there um then they have a couple of special levels at the end emulating moonraker and then they have a temple level where you've got baron samadhi from live and let die in there and they've got a golden gun as well so that's quite cool uh yeah By the way, a little bit of trivia which i think you'll get um rare the you know developer mm -hmm. they only had one other game that they ever created that did better than goldeneye do you know what that game is was it perfect dark not banjo was kazooie no it was donkey yeah. kong country no way yeah oh, that's so interesting. so um it so golden i sold about nine million which is just phenomenal just ridiculous yeah. but donkey kong country edged it out by just a little bit huh interesting stupid, stupid monkey <laughs> yeah huh 
We just thought Octopussy had stupid monkeys, but no. <laughs> um, so what's your so, relationship like with GoldenEye? Did you play it uh, oh, yeah. a lot when it came out? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, it's interesting, too, because I was um, not so much anymore, but I was a pretty significant gamer. And when yeah. I say gamer, you know, the type of individuals that would have stressful jobs, but and, you know, great family life. But still, you know, they would carve out an hour or more uh, nice. to really play games and i remember even with yeah. um danielle you know we would play uh, a lot of puzzle games um uh, silent hill the very first silent hill which is scary as shit yeah uh, oh so just crazy and and back then the graphics were like revolutionary and the sounds the sounds especially but yeah. she and i would play that in this like loft area of our apartment <laughs> and just but she was great because she's so much smarter than me so she would be able to figure out the puzzles and I would be sitting there like banging like, you know, little creatures that are trying to bite my knee. And she's yeah. like, you know, go left and then say something to it. And so, yes, <laughs> um, long way of answering. Yes, I played GoldenEye quite a bit. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.